Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar, Entrepreneurship and Communities of Color, How We Can Help Minority Businesses Grow and Communities Thrive. My name is Sarah Murphy Gray, your host for today's webinar and the Senior Policy and Program Associate at the Center for Global Policy Solutions. The Center for Global Policy Solutions is a 501c3 think tank and action organization that labors in pursuit of vibrant, diverse, and inclusive world in which everyone has the opportunity to thrive in safe and sustainable environments. Our mission is to make policy work for people and their environments by advancing economic security, health, education, and civic success for vulnerable populations. This webinar and the report are a part of the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative, which seeks to build awareness and support for efforts to address racial and ethnic wealth inequalities based on structural factors. Today's webinar will address opportunities to expand economic security through local programs that support all residents, something especially important in communities of color. Algernon Austin, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Global Policy Solutions, recently found in his report, The Color of Entrepreneurship, Why the Racial Wealth Gap Among Firms is Costing the U.S. Billions, that encouraging entrepreneurship among people of color is essential to building their communities and the American landscape as the cultural fabric of our country becomes more vibrant. Our webinar will lead off with a presentation on Algernon's findings from this report and be followed by our colleagues Marla Villonis, Executive Director from Latino Economic Development Center, and Thomas Yu, Strategic Development Officer from Asian Americans for Equality. As a quick housekeeping note, your questions are welcome throughout the presentation. Um, you can fill them in in the chat bar that you see on the left side, and they will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to enter any questions that you may have for our presenters um, as you see them. The Latino Economic Development Center. The founders of the Latino Economic Development Center applied for and received seed funding from the District of Columbia's Office of Business and Economic Development to develop an organization that would help low-income Latinos build assets through small business development, home ownership counseling, and tenant organizing. In 1991, LEDC was incorporated as a community-based nonprofit 501c3 organization in the offices of the National Council of Ladassa. We are happy to have Marla Bolonic, the executive director of LEDC, with us today. Also, we have Asian Americans for Equality. Asian Americans for Equality was founded in 1974 to advocate for equal rights. It has transformed in the past four decades to become one of New York's preeminent housing, social service, and community development organizations. Employing innovative approaches, the organization has preserved and developed 86 buildings, creating more than 800 units of housing. It has secured almost $300 million in mortgage financing for home buyers and disbursed $30 million in loans to hundreds of small businesses. We are thankful to have all of our presenters here today, and we will begin with Algernon Austin. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, let me advance the slides. So I'll be talking about the color of entrepreneurship after the Great Recession. Um, I'm really highlighting uh, some of the key findings from the color of entrepreneurship report, and then digging a little deeper into uh, uh, some of those findings. Uh, yeah, and this is the slide, this is um, uh, the link to the report. So before I get into the report, it's important that uh, we understand the methodology behind the report. This will allow us to better understand the report and, uh, and appreciate it, and also understand how it may differ from other similar research. I used the U.S. Census Bureau Survey of Business Owners uh, from 2012 and 2007. Those are the, <coughs> the surveys conducted every five years. Those are the two most recent years for the survey. Um, 
Uh, I look just at uh, the survey uh, looks just at privately held firms. <coughs> privately held firms are identifiable by race, ethnicity, and gender. Publicly traded firms, tr firms that are traded on a stock exchange, uh, are not identifiable by race, ethnicity, and gender, and therefore not part of the analysis. Publicly traded firms are more likely, or tend to be larger than privately held firms. So the analysis is not all businesses, just the businesses that are privately held that can be identified by race, ethnicity, and gender. Unlike other reports, I focus in on businesses with paid employees. So uh, some other analyses mix businesses without employees um, in with businesses with paid employees. This analysis focuses in on businesses uh, with paid employees. Uh, and these businesses, uh, when they're doing well, they provide an income for, their own, for the, the owner or owners, um, as well as for the employees. Uh, uh, businesses with paid employees tend to be larger and tend to have a bigger economic impact uh, for, for, for all the reasons that I mentioned. Another thing that's really important for, to understand for this report um, is that in between, I'm uh, comparing 2012 to 2007, in that time period we had the Great Recession, the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression, and that certainly shapes the findings in the data. Uh, in 2012, uh, because the downturn was so severe, we're really just starting to see the the, the beginnings of the recovery in 2012. So those are important points to keep in mind in, in terms of understanding the analysis. Here, uh, at various points in the report, I compare uh, the distribution of business owners uh, uh, with the labor force. But it's important to keep in mind that the labor force is made up of individuals. Uh, firms, however, are not individuals. Um, a firm can be owned by more than one individual, um, and there could be various combinations. So a firm can be owned by white men, uh, you know, it can have a white male owner, a, a Latino owner, and uh, an Asian uh, American Indian man uh, as a co-owner. So here, I focus in on these ten categories, but this does not present all of the various combinations of categories you can have for firm ownership. But these are the, the ten that I focus in on. Um, and I use the labor force uh, as a rough comparison. So what we can see in this table is that while uh, white men make up 40.5% uh, uh, of the labor force in 2012, uh, they made up 57.1% of the owners of firms with paid employees. Um, and so we see a, a slight overrepresentation of white men um, in terms of owning firms with paid employees. For, for most of the other groups, there's an underrepresentation. So you can look one below to the second line, and you see that although white women make up about make up 35% of the labor force. Um, they made up only 16.7% of the firms with paid employees. Uh, so we see an underrepresentation relative to their share of the labor force. Um, and that underrepresentation is similar, it, it is present for, for most of the groups. Uh, it's not there for Asian American men. You see Asian American men uh, make up 5.5% of the uh, owners with paid employees, the firms with paid employees, but 2.9% of the labor force. Asian American women, you see their numbers, the 2.5% relative to the 2.7% are nearly, nearly the same. Uh, but for the other groups, you see an underrepresentation. Uh, with looking at the Asian American data, it's important to keep in mind that the Asian American population is quite diverse um, and different subgroups. Um, have uh, better uh, socioeconomic profiles than others. Unfortunately, uh, in this analysis, I don't, uh, I, I was not able, uh, or I don't disaggregate the data, so you can't see the, the variation in the Asian American population. Uh, let me move on. So some of the key findings of the color of entrepreneurship. 
Um, looking just at the, the firms that added jobs between 2007 and 2012, non-white business owners added 72.3% of the total. So businesses owned by people of color uh, have played an important role in helping the U.S. economy recover from the Great Recession. Um, uh, white men, uh, uh, firms owned by white men did not have a, uh, did not add jobs in this period in part, and, and one very important reason for that was uh, because of the construction industry. White men dominated the, con or dominate the construction industry considerably, and during the housing boom, no doubt these firms grew and, and were very profitable, uh, but then with the housing bust, um, we saw a significant decline. Uh, so uh, for, we saw a reduction of 61,000 in terms of construction firms owned by white men, and in terms of the number of employees uh, that declined, that was uh, a, about one million, so about one million jobs were lost, and, and that's part of the reason why we see it a negative for white men over this time period. Um, although people of color have, have had a significant positive effect in the economy um, over this time period, uh, people of color are still significantly underrepresented as owners of firms with uh, employees. If they were proportionally, more proportionally represented there would be 1.1 million more businesses owned by people of color, uh, and these businesses would add about 9 million jobs and about 300 billion in workers' income to the U.S. economy. So there is certainly a lot more to be done in terms of increasing uh, business ownership and entrepreneurship in communities of color, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that today. Uh, here in this slide, I just show the growth, the, the, the change in the number of firms um, uh, relative to the change in the labor force. Um, so if a population, for example, were to double, I would expect the number of uh, entrepreneurs or business owners to also increase in that population. So I use the change in the labor force as, a, again, a rough benchmark so that people can get a sense of, well, how is this group, this group doing relative to, to uh, population growth? And we see that the numbers for Asian American women that are the strongest, 37, an increase of 37.6%. Uh, that's quite impressive. Um, and even when you consider that the Asian American female labor force uh, grew significantly, 22.9%. Uh, uh, for Latinas, for Hispanic women, we see strong growth, uh, but that growth is, is about matching the growth in, in labor force. For Asian American men, we, we also see good growth that's exceeding the, uh, the growth in the labor force. For black women, we see pretty strong growth uh, when you consider, uh, you know, growth of 20.2%. Um, and a labor market growth of 8.8%, so very strong growth when you consider the, the growth in the labor force. Uh, Hispanic men, Asian, uh, uh, Hispanic men, American Indian women, American Indian men, and white women also had uh, decent to sort of moderate growth in terms of the number of firms with paid employees. For white men, we see it, the numbers are almost flat. Uh, the growth is only 0.3% uh, in terms of the change in the number of firms, and this is less than what we see in terms of the change in the labor force of 1.8%. Unfortunately, black men stand out. They're the only group of the 10 where we saw an absolute decline in the number of firms uh, with paid employees. So we see a negative of 2.3% for black men. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. So right now I'm just highlighting um, in terms of the industries where we see growth for, for the different groups, uh, looking at the two strongest industries uh, 
first for women, and then I'll look for, for men. And I highlight uh, uh, the health care and social assistance because um, for all of the, the, the women's groups that I look at, health care and social assistance is where there's the strongest growth. So we see that for white women, Asian American women, Hispanic women, and here for African American women and for American Indian women. And now uh, looking at the same, doing the same analysis for men, uh, for these three, first three groups, we see that accommodation and food services are where we have the strongest growth for white men, Asian American men, and Hispanic men. Um, for African American men, it's different. African American men, uh, it's healthcare and social assistance, the same industry uh, grouping for, for that we saw for women. And for American Indian men, it's a, it's a completely different pattern. Um, so they're unique in terms of uh, the industries where they saw the strongest growth. Uh, looking at a little more deeply at the declines, uh, uh, the, the dynamics for, black, for firms owned by black men, uh, the strongest declines were in reach, retail trade and construction. So in this slide, I'm comparing uh, the percentage change um, in these two industries uh, for, for different groups of men. Uh, so we see that uh, for white men and for American Indian men, there's a slight decline in terms of their firms with, and retail trade, but we see a really massive decline for, for black men um, and growth uh, for Hispanic men and Asian, Asian American men. Um, in construction, uh, there's a uh, significant decline for white men and American Indian men, but um, a much stronger decline um, in terms of construction firms for black men. And for Hispanic men and Asian American men, it's basically flat in terms of construction firms uh, over this time period. So what are some of the factors that influence minority business success? The, the most important one is wealth capital. Most firms uh, are started by people drawing on their own wealth or their family's wealth. So some of the wealth disparities that exist um, feed into the disparities that we see in business ownership. Um, uh, another factor, experience-based human capital. If you have an older relative who owns a business and you've worked in their business, that's, that's been positively correlated with the likelihood of you being a successful entrepreneur. Uh, it's probably also the case if you have management experience um, in a particular, uh, generally or specifically in, the, in a particular industry that can probably translate for you uh, being an entrepreneur in, in that industry. Overall, formal human capital is a positive. The better educated you are, uh, the more likely you are to be successful. And uh, among immigrants generally, uh, regardless of, of race or ethnic background, uh, the foreign-born population is, is uh, slightly more likely to be entrepreneurs than the U.S. foreign population. Uh, with these things in mind, uh, in the report, I uh, mentioned 12 different policy recommendations here. I'm just highlighting a few of them. Uh, in terms of wealth, uh, uh, we propose two different tax credits, one for larger businesses, the venture capital tax credit, uh, to try to get some of that venture capital into uh, communities of color. Uh, and for smaller businesses, a, a low a tax credit for low-income new entrepreneurs. Uh, there are a number of government agencies and nonprofit organizations that serve small businesses, and we recommend that these agencies need to do much better in terms of uh, doing outreach to entrepreneurs of color to make sure that these entrepreneurs get the, the, tra the training, the contacts, uh, the resources they need to be successful. And on the flip side, we also, you know, encourage entrepreneurs of color to actively uh, seek out, be aware that these 
these organizations exist and to act actively seek out these organizations. And we're lucky today to have two organizations, two of these nonprofits that serve uh, entrepreneurs of color who will uh, speak following me. Now we'd like to welcome Marla Bilonek. Hello, everyone. Um, Wow, this is really a trippy experience having never done a webinar of this scale. So um, thank you so much to the Center for Global Policy Solutions for including me in today's event. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so to get started, I just wanted to introduce folks to our organization, Latino Economic Development Center, uh, most commonly known as LEDC. Uh, is an organization that has been around for 25 years. We started in 1991, and our mission is to serve Latino and other underserved communities through asset building and preservation interventions in housing and small business development in the D.C. and Baltimore metro areas. And um, I really like to talk about the work that we do as asset building and asset preservation rather than you know, just housing services and small business services, because I really feel like the difference that we're making is in helping um, you know, entrepreneurs and residents of color access uh, assets and financial wherewithal so that they can improve their lives, their families' lives, the people that they hire, um, and their communities' lives ultimately. And so that's really what keeps us going and, and gets us up in the morning. And, and that's what we do here at LADC. So um, because we're talking about entrepreneurship today, I'll just speak a little bit more in detail about the services that we do. Um, in direct contact with entrepreneurs. We help people start and grow businesses in the communities where we work through three interventions. So that's one-on-one um, -on -one technical assistance, classroom training, and then we also have a loan fund and we give folks loans from five dollars to $50,000 to start or expand their businesses. Um, we typically work with around 700 entrepreneurs per year, and we do anywhere between 100 and 130-ish loans per year to small businesses. And again, that's in the five to $50,000 range. Um, and so just sort of reflecting for the purposes of this webinar, wanted to talk about some root causes from our observations of working with clients. So the first is just that, and this is sort of stating the obvious, and this is, you know, was definitely ring true in Algernon's paper, um, is that it takes money to make money. So you know, when you're really living paycheck to paycheck, there's not a lot of wiggle room to be putting money aside to invest in either starting a business or purchasing a home as our clients are looking to do. And so that's really the first hurdle that we find is just finding or setting aside that extra bit of money here and there wherever possible. Um, which is really a huge struggle. Um, you know, and then also because of this, African American and Latino families and, and arguably all low income families hold lower levels of business and financial assets. And this is key to accessing financing for starting a business venture. So if you don't have anything to secure a loan with, whether that be a car or um, you know, any other sort of asset, even a piece of equipment in your business to collateralize the loan, it's much more challenging to uh, access financing. So that's a challenge that we face even in our alternative lending practice. You know, we have to get really creative around how we're going to secure our loans. Um, then you know, just low educational attainment, just to give a, stat, a statistic from D.C., which is where I'm speaking to you from today, um, only 32% of Latinos in D.C. hold, or sorry, 32% of Latinos in D.C. hold less than a high school diploma. So that's certainly a challenge. Um, there are other discussions that we will not have today around whether accessing higher education and putting yourself further in debt um, helps or hinders the cause. But um, you know, certainly just having low education it puts you um, at a greater risk for not being able to achieve the dream of owning a business. Um, also, uh, access to capital to put toward asset building is increasingly limited, and covert discrimination still exists in terms of loan application approvals and rejections. And um, you know, this is we could have thousands of webinars about just this topic, but um, there really has been a history of covert um, and maybe even overt discrimination in our commercial banking. Um, practices, and so that obviously puts people of color at a 
major disadvantage. There actually have been recent studies where actors have gone in with the exact same profile, one white, one of color, and you know, no surprise who gets approved and who gets rejected. And actually the um, CFPB is about to engage in a major effort um, to try and investigate this and take action on this. So it's promising, but it's just something to keep in mind when thinking about sort of why um, are entrepreneurs of color struggling. Um, another item that's not on this list, but I just wanted to include too, is just that conventional credit scoring models um, as a basis for financial decisions put entrepreneurs of color and, and even more so immigrants uh, at a disadvantage just because um, you know, immigrants who are new to the country may suffer just from having no credit profile, not necessarily having a poor credit history, but just not having established a credit profile. And so um, you know, an emerging field is just finding alternative methods for analyzing someone's financial profile. So you know, perhaps taking utilities payments or even remittances um, or wholesale relationships that an entrepreneur might have where they extend credit um, and keep putting those into the model that you're looking at when you're analyzing someone's financial position um, versus just your FICO score. Um, you know, and just another little data point is that it's estimated that 53 million Americans do not have a FICO score. So you know, I think there is a case to be made for looking at alternative methods um, because debt is not always the answer. Um, also, in our case of the clients that we work with, language and information barriers certainly hinder success in asset building. Um, you know, if you're not speaking the language of the community where you live, you are just missing pieces of information. You don't know the regulatory system. You don't even necessarily know sort of how, um, what the steps are to start a business. And so that's a lot of what we do at LATC is you know, explain the steps, explain what agencies you'll need to interface with, what are the licenses and permits required. Um, and, and while DC has very good language access uh, programs, it is still a struggle to find someone who can speak to you at an agency in your own language. Um, also, you know, a lot of our clients have uh, just a legacy of distrust in institutions, particularly financial institutions. There are many cases in Latin America where banks you know, simply shut their doors and keep your savings and your checking account um, and you have no access. So it, it makes it clear why folks struggle to open a bank account when they come here. Um, and also there is a fear that engaging with institutions could somehow result in deportation if you're here illegally. And so there's a whole you know, sort of cloud around that. Um, and then lastly, and, and this was touched upon by Algernon, just the lack of networks certainly hinder um, our entrepreneurs from moving to the next level. Um, so just a couple of points that I wanted to elevate from Algernon's report. Um, I think really the main finding from this slide, and I may have misstated that last point about um, Hispanic business growth, but I think really the dichotomy is around uh, business growth versus the growth of sales. And um, last year Stanford's Latino Enterprise Institute published a report that shows that Latinos start businesses at three times the rate of non-Latinos. So in our case we're not so concerned that they're not starting businesses, but what we're finding is that their sales are really lagging behind. And that same report um, demonstrated that non-Latino-owned businesses um, were outperforming Latino-owned businesses by $1.4 billion a year as an aggregate. So that's certainly alarming, and, and we wonder why that is. It might be because the businesses are newer, um, these Latino-owned startups. Um, again, it could be the lack of networks lack of information. Um, something else that I wanted to mention is that um, the industries that we see most commonly in the Latino clients that we're serving are um, food. So anything having to do with food, it could be a restaurant, catering, um, food truck, a uh, lot of retail. We have cleaning services, construction, um, which doesn't necessarily align with Algernon's presentation, but we do see a lot of sort of um, folks who might be working for a construction company branch off and create their own subcontracting firm, um, and then daycare as well. So just thought that might be an interesting point for folks to note. Um, then another 
area that we're looking at um, with a lot closer attention at LADC is this issue of asset retention and transfer. So there's also sort of the next generation of uh, LADC clients that are coming up, and we want them to benefit from the legacy of what their parents or grandparents may have already established. So for those people who have started businesses, we want to make sure that they hold on to those businesses. And so we, um, you know, really within the last, I'd say, one to two years have been really getting our feet wet in asset retention as it pertains to small business. And so really thinking deliberately about how we can mitigate gentrification's impact on small businesses along quickly changing corridors in the communities that we serve. And in particular in D.C. we're focusing on Georgia Avenue for anyone who is local, um, which is just really one of these commercial corridors that's on the brink of massive change. They just put in a metro um, in the past five years. They've got a lot of momentum and new condos and lots of new, you know, things that are, are great, but we also want to make sure that folks who are business owners and thriving you know, stay in place and are able to pass on this asset to future generations, and also continue providing livelihoods for themselves and the people that they hire in the community. So um, you know, in looking at this, we've looked at um, California. The Mission District is really um, an innovator in this. Um, so it's really um, an interesting case because they are a few steps ahead of us. And so they are looking at how to save businesses in the Mission District. They are actually looking at legacy businesses that have been around for 20 or 30 years that are at a real risk of displacement. And they have created a legacy business fund which is really a subsidy for landlords to incentivize them to give these legacy businesses 10-year or longer leases so that they aren't pushed out um, as Silicon Valley sort of moves into the mission and folks from the mission move into Oakland. So um, something um, interesting to look at how that it, it literally just started um, Thanksgiving of last year at that time period. So we're still a little bit too soon to know whether that's a best practice, um, but certainly something we're keeping our eyes on. Another sort of pilot project that we have in Montgomery County, Maryland is um, in partnership with the county government in supporting small businesses that are in an area that is about to go under um, major redevelopment, uh, a real estate redevelopment, commercial redevelopment. And so um, the county has actually stepped up and they have a financial assistance program that they're putting into place. So we're helping connect businesses to that, but we're also providing them with one-on-one -on -one assistance to sort of um, get ready for this change and then also pivot as the needs of their market change with the changes that will come from this um, redevelopment project. So again, it's a little early to say um, whether our interventions will make the difference, but that's something that we're really keeping our eye on um, and hope to also apply to our third market of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, just another uh, item that I wanted to add was just that on a policy level, we need to address systemic issues that have created a negative legacy for entrepreneurs of color. I did mention um, you know, just covert or overt uh, discriminatory lending practices. I actually um, very timely yesterday participated um, in a group at the White House that the SBA assembled, which is the Small Business Administration, um, which is called PLUM, the Plan for Lending to Underserved Markets. And um, they just pointed out a really startling data point, which was that um, you know, between 2007 and 2012, African American businesses grew by 11 percent, by yet SBA loans to African American owned businesses decreased by 91 percent. So that, I mean, everyone just held their breath in the room when that data point was stated. It's just very um, concerning and, and uh, you know, just the very entity that has put in, been put into place to support struggling small businesses, um, you know, has decreased their funding to African American owned businesses. So, um, you know, the good point, the good part of it is that they are aware and they are really working to make that change, but they, um, you know, put that out there, and I thought that was important to include today. Uh, the other thing that I would add is just something to keep our eye on, um, that bank deserts, the closing of banks um, in low-income neighborhoods. So since 2008, 
93% of the 1,826 FDIC banks that closed were located in low-income neighborhoods. And the reason why I think that's important to note for this presentation is just that um, financing is such a huge part of business success that if traditional financial institutions close, you lose that access to traditional financial services. And so the alternative is not usually your neighborhood CDFI. It's typically a payday lender or a check cashing service you know, which assesses fees and sometimes takes part in usurious practices. And it's just um, this sort of movement of the banking industry is a real concern as it impacts not only entrepreneurs but just residents in low-income neighborhoods. So I wanted to elevate that point as well. So that is actually it for my presentation. It looks like I'm exactly on time. Um, and I just invite you all to come visit our offices. Um, my contact information is here if you want to reach out directly in our address. Um, we're in Shaw for anyone who is calling in from Washington, D.C. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marla. Now we're actually going to turn to Thomas Yu um, with Asian Americans for Equality. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on the webinar. I'm going to go through a very brief uh, background of uh, our organization. Uh, we were founded, uh, as mentioned earlier, in 1974. It was a civil rights organization largely advocating on issues of uh, police brutality in the neighborhood as well as uh, opening up uh, local employment for uh, people of color, especially in the Chinatown community. And over the, the past few decades, uh, you can see on the first slide, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, we expanded to uh, from a volunteer organization uh, just doing volunteer civil rights advocacy and tenant landlord issues into a lot of different uh, asset building and uh, real estate development activities. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, around our small business lending, but uh, in terms of all our lines of businesses, we all try to link it up with each other so that uh, the small business lending in itself isn't something that is a standalone. Uh, you often see uh, our small business and uh, community development principles uh, you know, underlie uh, all of our lines of businesses. Um, this is just a quick snapshot. Our, we have a CDFI. Uh, that's a subsidiary of AFI called uh, Renaissance Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we just call it Renaissance for short. And it's been around for 15 years. Uh, we've made over $42 million in loan and grant capital uh, to over 1,000 small businesses and entrepreneurs in the New York City area. Uh, we've counseled. We do full cycle uh, pre and post counseling to over 4,500 4, uh, businesses as well. Uh, last year we were uh, ranked number three nationally in terms of volume uh, by uh, lending and then also uh, in the top 10 for a number of loans. We do about you know, uh, 70 to 100 uh, annually. And so a lot of people come to us and they ask us, you know, do you only uh, serve Asian Americans? And the answer is no. We actually serve uh, anyone that comes into our doors and targeted neighborhood areas. And actually we have a quite a substantial number of uh, folks who uh, receive technical assistance or financing from us that are not Asian American. Uh, we also couple that with a job placement program so that uh, we do look at ways so that we can pair uh, job placement and workforce development with a lot of the small businesses that we help because sometimes there's a lot of, in the same neighborhoods, you do have uh, labor as well as job creation issues. And it makes sense that uh, usually in the same clusters, you do have some sort of cultural and language uh, affinities that you can really tap uh, in order to promote uh, uh, growth in both areas. Um, we also sponsor a lot of uh, different initiatives that try to really tie in together different uh, partners and different ethnic groups that may traditionally have not uh, worked together. Uh, for example, we on our real estate development side, we're building a new community and commercial center in a largely African-American neighborhood uh, to build 
a healthy food supermarket for the residents there. Uh, it's, it's part of a New York City that was devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, most of the retail have not been rebuilt, and so they don't have access uh, to uh, healthy groceries that are affordable, uh, with the nearest uh, supermarket being over two miles away uh, and public transportation uh, not serving the neighborhood well, uh, we have over 10,000 residents uh, who cannot have uh, you know, healthy groceries. And so we're, we do that in terms of the real estate development uh, with local partners so that we co-own it. And then we also partner in helping other groups uh, create you know, uh, their incipient CDFIs or technical assistance uh, so that you know we can exit and that they can be self-sufficient as well. Uh, we're also experimenting with uh, doing it around the country through some of our national networks where we've worked a lot with groups that do uh, small business and community development in uh, refugee populations. And so we also uh, are experimenting with one program out in Ohio where we provide some of our loan capital and utilize their local expertise in terms of the marketing and the post-loan uh, counseling that we think is very important for uh, you know, uh, loan servicing uh, and making sure that the entrepreneur and the business is viable after the fact. Uh, we often work in immigrant communities that you know, they cannot get conventional financing from banks. Uh, one of the largest impediments is um, language access, but uh, also even if sometimes if they are able to speak English, they're not able to get the financing because their tax returns don't show that the businesses are generating uh, enough income uh, to support a loan. Uh, that's because a lot of small businesses, uh, as you all probably are aware of, uh, are cash-based. And so the way we are able to successfully lend out a lot of our uh, capital is to underwrite using uh, the, the tax uh, returns, but also checking on alternative ways uh, to figure out how much the business is uh, cash flowing. So we can, if it's a restaurant, for example, we can look at things like their receipts, their uh, cost uh, of food inventory, their utility bills for gas, and looking at their menu and see how, how much is a dish. And so knowing how many uh, let's say dishes or plates they, they, they sell per day, we can do a, actually a better estimate of what, uh, how much cash is going through or generated from the business. And usually a lot of these businesses can actually support uh, uh, a small business loan, and so we usually make that uh, loan to them. And uh, coupled with a very uh, engaged post-placement uh, counseling and technical assistance, we have a very low default rate. It's, it's just 1% uh, traditionally. I'm just going to go to the next slide here. Uh, we're also the only nonprofit CDFI in, in New York City to do a disaster recovery fund. Uh, this was more out of a necessity that we just don't have the luxury of not having one. Uh, it started when we had we were uh, in Chinatown when we experienced the September 11 attacks, and you know, if you, those of you who are not familiar with the geography, Chinatown is uh, very close to the World Trade Center site, and it was within the security lockdown zone afterwards. So then, a lot of the businesses uh, began; uh, they, they were shut down because they couldn't get uh, foot traffic and the customer base uh, coming into the neighborhood with the security shutdown of Lower Manhattan. And so we had thousands of business on the brink uh, of uh, closing and going out of business for good. Uh, we uh, worked through our uh, small business CDFI to distribute a lot of uh, emergency loans and capital and kept uh, uh, hundreds of businesses afloat uh, throughout the disaster. And since then, we permanently established a disaster emergency recovery fund so that uh, in subsequent uh, major disasters such as like Hurricane Sandy or if there was a citywide utility blackout or uh, lately we've had gas explosions in uh, specific buildings due to aging infrastructure or shoddy work from you know contractors, uh, we're able to get a lot of the small businesses back up and running quickly or at least uh, help them stay alive through the ordeal because things such as like, you know, 
uh, buying back inventory for their businesses or keeping payroll are some of the, the just the everyday things they need to do in order to keep their business afloat uh, while they're trying to weather uh, that uh, disaster. And so uh, it's gotten more and more efficient over uh, time because it's, unfortunately we had a lot of disasters to deal with. And so um, in, in the Hurricane Sandy event, uh, we were able to distribute 3.3 million uh, very quickly in the, in the next just uh, two, three weeks after the storm uh, to uh, over 150 businesses. Uh, we found that this is uh, very important in terms of having helping neighborhoods that already are, you know, uh, heavily impacted from gentrification or they have low income and other uh, things that uh, were there even before this disaster being able to come back uh, more quickly when uh, it just takes so long for uh, federal or local or state aid to flow in. Uh, and even then, some of the application processes uh, make them you know, ineligible for the, the recovery money anyway. So then uh, the CDFI actually becomes a really important uh, uh, bridging mechanism for them to stay alive. Uh, this is just a picture of one of our developments. Uh, but even in our real estate development, we really uh, really want to maintain the kind of uh, street life that is conducive for small business, mom and pop entrepreneurship. Uh, in, the, in a lot of the city RFPs that come out, uh, what happens is that they promote, you know, they, they look for big box commercial anchor tenants, and we argue that uh, we really need to carve out spaces for small businesses, and we actively do that in our developments. And this is just one of the developments that uh, we're slated to break ground in Queens uh, that has uh, a retail street level that maintains uh, the, the contextual character and feel of the surrounding area. And this allows you know, small-time local entrepreneurs to have a shot at being able to open a business in city-sponsored developments that are happening in their own neighborhoods. Uh, that's it for me in terms of slides, and uh, we'll be ready to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Thomas. So yes, now we're actually going to open it up to questions. So of course, if you, I know that a few of you have mentioned your questions throughout the presentation, um, but if you'd like to ask any additional questions, now is definitely the time. So um, moving to one of the first questions, it is um, from Daryl Tyler. What is the proportion of organizations and service providers catering to supporting women-owned women businesses, um, and black women specifically, to those providing support to men-owned businesses, and black men specifically? I believe this question was directed actually to Algernon. Okay, uh, I'll respond, but um, I, I uh, invite Marla and Thomas to jump in um, because they know more um, on the sort of grassroots level. In terms, so my understanding is that uh, you know the government agencies and nonprofits are are open to anyone. Um, we do see, so I think that question may be prompted by the decline that we saw in firms own by black men, and it's important to, to uh, remember earlier in the presentation, you may not, I didn't highlight it, but there are more, there are more firms earned by black men than by black women. However, we're seeing uh, pretty strong growth uh, in terms of firms owned by black women. So um, I think the generally uh, the resources are open to all groups or, or to, to black men and black women equally. Um, generally, we see more firms are owned by men than by women, so we see that, that disparity. However, uh, as I mentioned, over the recent period, we did see an absolute decline in firms owned by black men. Thank you so much, Alton. So actually, stemming off of this question, um, we had another question from Michael Elliott. His question was, the report states, that government and nonprofits must do better to improve their outreach to people of color. Can you elaborate a bit more on this? Okay, I'm going to pass this one off to Marla and Thomas. Again, they have a more grounded experience. 
what do you what do you all think? Do you think that uh, there is more work that needs to be done um, by government agencies and by nonprofits? Is there is what's the need that you're seeing on the ground? Um, I can jump in, Thomas, if you if that works. It's very odd to not see everybody's faces and know who's about to say something, but I'll just add my two cents and then Thomas if you want to say sure. something. Um, I, I wanted to just first address the first question that we talked about because um, I would agree with Algernon's assessment that most nonprofits, just as Thomas said in his presentation, and I don't know that I necessarily drove it home that well in, in hours, but you know, while we may have a niche or a cultural competency that we can provide in the community, we certainly are open to anyone in the communities that we serve and we do not you know, actively discriminate to non-Latino clients. In fact, we have a rainbow of clients coming through our doors and, and I just say that's sort of our niche and our specialty that we can offer in the community, but we certainly have general services that apply to everyone and, and we do apply them to everyone. So, wanted to say that, but I also wanted to say there are some initiatives aimed at women-owned businesses like the SBA has women's business centers that are not exclusively for women but certainly are catering to women. Um, and those, you know, I believe are, are located in almost every uh, municipality in the United States. So that is sort of the thing that came to mind. There are also some smaller, you know, locally some smaller nonprofit initiatives that are aimed specifically at women. Um, I don't know that I'm aware of any um, sort of male-focused uh, nonprofits working in this space, but um, you know, based on Algernon's report, there could be a case made certainly for for that. But I'm I'm just not aware. And then to answer the second question, I would say um, I don't necessarily know that nonprofits, um, and I'm not just saying this in my own defense, but you know, I think most nonprofits are working with low-income communities and are located in those very low-income communities. So. Um, you know, I definitely think it's a challenge to divide time for the frontline staff between whether they're providing direct service or marketing our direct service. So I think you know, certainly there's room for improvement on spending more time on the outreach piece um, and balancing that with direct service, but it's, it is kind of a Sophie's choice that we have to make. Um, but certainly, you know, after having spent the day with SBA yesterday, I think they're very aware that they are, there is some sort of disconnect and that folks who are accessing their programs are not necessarily the people that they design the programs for. And so um, there's certainly room for improvement there. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say that, uh, yeah, I, don't ha I haven't seen any uh, programs that are, like Marla said, that were specifically targeting men, but they're, uh, you know, when we do kind of the outreach in the neighborhoods, it's not really always uh, gender or race specific. So a lot of times we do have uh, all kinds of people come in for our services uh, as a kind of a byproduct of just general uh, outreach and marketing. Uh, I would say that in, at least in New York City, uh, there, are, there is kind of a pretty good marketing outreach, uh, especially with a lot of the different uh, language newspapers and media and cable television and radio. But I would say that uh, sometimes the, it's not the outreach that's the problem, but it's how they tailor the government program so that if it's built to a certain way that is structured so that it's almost impossible for a uh, entrepreneur or a small business owner to use, then you have quite a bit of apathy in the neighborhood where they stop paying attention to these kind of uh, you know, marketing strategies because they'll say, you know, we've heard a lot of these things, but when I actually go and check out the program, you know, like I don't have this document or that I'm disqualified for this technicality, and it has to be designed so that it really fits the kind of the need of the local community that they're trying to serve. And I think that actually would probably do much better because what ha happens then is that uh, we have a lot of businesses come through via word of mouth so that once one gets a very you know, uh, successful service and being, uh, they were helped by the program, you, know, like you have a lot of them coming on their own. And so it's really having that program work in the first place. Thank you so much. So moving to the next question. Um, the next question is, what are some best practices you've experienced while working on your asset 
retention and transfer. Uh, Lisa, I think that one was directed to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually, I wish I could say, I don't feel like we have enough time under our belts to say what the best practices are. The interventions that we are doing are direct technical assistance, um, some training, and then financing or connecting into government financing um, support. And then in addition, there is an advocacy element to it as well. So organizing businesses that are in uh, threatened areas so that they can advocate on behalf of their own rights or perceived rights or desired rights. So um, you know, I, I hope to have some, some data for you all, success metrics um, and performance, positive performance results to, to give you maybe in a year's time. Um, but I would also just point out if anyone wants to do some Google research, um, Neighborhood Development Center in Minneapolis is also working on this. Um, topic, uh, and they uh, sort of are developing a model um, around this as well, and we're in conversation with them frequently. So um, I think it's happening all over. I see someone else down below said that there's something going on in Phoenix. Happy to talk to you offline, Mr. Montoya, but um, definitely um, you know, this is an emerging issue, and I think um, there are nonprofits just like LADC working in other parts of the U.S. trying to tackle it. Great. And um, I just want to take this moment really quickly um, to, address the, to address one recurring uh, question. So there will be copies of the PowerPoint um, made available to attendees after this webinar. Um, also, I just wanted to highlight that um, we, I know that we have a, a ton of questions flooding in, um, and I want to give an opportunity for a few more of these to be answered. Um, if it's okay with Marla and Thomas, um, we're willing to stay um, for an additional five minutes um, to answer a few more questions. Um, but we will have the PowerPoint available to attendees. Sure. Thomas, are you are you able to stay? Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Has um, anyone, um, does anyone know of any data on Pacific Islander entrepreneurs? Uh, I guess I could take that one. Uh, there's very little data on Pacific Islander entrepreneurs, and I think as uh, Algernon kind of alluded to in the beginning, uh, you know they're usually lumped in with the Asian American uh, statistics. And we've been pushing a lot of the federal agencies and a lot of our research partners to disaggregate uh, the data because it masks so many nuances uh, within the population uh, where uh, it looks like sometimes you know, there's a lot of high growth in uh, Asian American businesses, but it depends on the region. And there's certainly uh, particular to this population, it's a high clustering within urban areas that also mean that they're generally in neighborhoods that are experiencing heavy gentrification or high, extremely high cost of living. And so, uh, so despite some of the kind of rosy figures, when we get an aggregate, uh, you'll, you'll still see that a lot of them are struggling because uh, they're grouped together. And so, um, and one other thing that despite, I think this is true amongst uh, a lot of other uh, ethnic groups, not just Asian Americans, uh, you, often, you often see that uh, there's a lot of business growth uh, within certain sub, you know, ethnic or racial categories. But a lot of the studies show that the businesses are uh, lacking in terms of kind of retail diversity. So then, for example, you might have uh, a lot of businesses open by a certain ethnic group, but then they all end up being the same type of business, and they're all next to each other. So then they actually depress the, the kind of uh, the sales and their earning power. So we see that a lot in our community where, let's say, if one type of restaurant opens, then uh, you'll, you'll have like five other ones that are exactly the same. And so uh, to, in order to kind of address that, it's really working with the businesses, one, to, to uh, work with them on their uh, business plan to say, look, have you looked around and seen what else is already in the neighborhood? And two, really promote uh, innovation that they can uh, not just kind of cookie cutter do the same exact type of business that we think you know it might put them at risk of failing. 
Great, thank you. So um, moving to the next question, um, Abigail wanted to know what are some specific things that can be done to accelerate Latino-owned businesses specifically and minority-owned businesses generally? Um, oh, I'll start and anyone, of course, jump in. Um, I would say for Latino-owned businesses, the I would say the main thing that could be done is connect them to capital. And so I really think this access to capital piece is the missing link. I think oftentimes for any small business, but particularly for minority-owned small businesses um, and Latino-owned small businesses who may not know, you know navigating um, systems and regulations and, and that sort of thing, the, um, there are growth opportunity moments. Um, and if you don't have the capital to fulfill on those moments, you lose the opportunity and you don't grow. And so I think you know, just to give a tangible example, let's say a contractor who has an opportunity to, you know, they bid on, a, on an opportunity and they win that opportunity, but then they don't actually have the financing to fulfill on the opportunity, whether that's to pay extra people or to buy the supplies and the materials needed to, to fulfill on the opportunity, that opportunity is lost. And that's typically what brings you into an entirely different market with different um, you know, folks that you can sell to new clients. And so th if those growth opportunities are missed because there's not enough cash flow in the business to uh, fulfill on the opportunity, that is where I sort of see the stunting happening from my own personal experience. I'm sure others have other comments to make. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, go for it. Sorry. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to skip ahead in, um, in the question and ask, um, ask Carmen's question. Carmen wanted to know, how is racialized mass incarceration impacting entrepreneurship for people of color, uh, men and women? For example, what opportunities are denied to individuals with an incarceration or arrest history, and how is research acknowledging this intersectionality? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and uh, others can uh, jump in and answer. I think, well, uh, if you have a, a criminal record, that's going to affect your ability to get certain license, licenses so that will uh, can uh, prevent you from starting particular types of businesses. Um, and, you know, generally that background leads to lower earnings, lower wealth. So. So it is depressing uh, formal entrepreneurship, uh, particularly among African American men who have a high rate of incarceration. I think, however, it also fosters, uh, on, on a yeah, ironically, I think it also fosters entrepreneurship because since people cannot may have the difficulty finding uh, jobs legally because of their record. They may start businesses, but businesses that are not uh, legally recognized. So they may um, start an underground business in, in the sense of they may uh, wash cars or repair cars or do other jobs that are, that are sort of off the books in, in terms of all the legal requirements for, for a business. So you, you probably foster a sort of underground businesses among ex-offenders because of their, their impediments of entering the sort of legal and, and above-ground labor market as well as above-ground businesses. Great. Thank you, Alphanon. So um, I have another question um, from Carlos. And this question is, um, if anyone can answer, approximately how many of the 53 million Americans without a FICO score are people of color? And what is some outreach that's being done to assist those um, without a FICO score? Thomas or Marla, would um, either of you all be able to answer that question? Um, I don't have the statistic on how many Ameri of the 53 Americans without a FICO score are people of color, but in terms of a lot of our 
technical assistance and counseling programs. Uh, when, when entrepreneurs sometimes come to us asking for a small business loan and they don't have that credit history, instead of giving the loan right away, we, we do a lot of uh, programming and counseling that helps them bi build you know, uh, credit. And so uh, very similar to home ownership, you have the IDA savings accounts. You know, we do similar things with uh, small business owners. There's also some cities that have uh, what are called lending circles that uh, it's more neighborhood and grassroots space where uh, they tap in on some of the cultural traditions of some of the immigrant uh, financing that took place in their home countries. Yeah, I could just say we do lending circles to help people build credits, which are credit, which is basically a peer group lending model. Um, we do it in partnership with Mission Asset Fund in San Francisco um, that has an automated platform. And then we also do small dollar loans to help people build credit along with just a lot of financial capability counseling like Thomas is discussing just to help people build that credit. Um, you know, start off small but just um, take on a little bit of a debt to build a credit history. Great. So I just want to thank everyone um, for their questions, um, Marla and Thomas, of course, and Algernon um, for presenting today um, with the Center for Global Policy Solutions. We know that this is such an important um, point and so, such important work that um, you all are doing, and we're very thankful to have you guys to talk about a lot of the work that you're doing in your various communities. Um, I just want to emphasize for anyone who was not able to um, ask their questions um, that the PowerPoint will be made available um, to all of the attendees and that that PowerPoint includes the email addresses um, from a number of our presenters. Um, so please feel free to reach out to them if you should desire. Also, um, we will be making the recording for this webinar available to all of the attendees as well. Um, so if you heard something that you want to revisit, um, you will be able to do so through the recording. We will also be sending you a survey um, for this webinar. We'd love to know what you thought and also um, any additional ideas for webinars moving forward. Also, I just want to thank you again for your attendance um, and for sticking around with us. And um, we look forward to hearing um, of all of the work that you're doing and of your survey results. So with that, I would also um, with that, I would like to say that the webinar has now concluded. <laughs>